All right, this is Circuit Repair Augusta doing another repair video. A little bit different today and just checking to make sure that live stream is coming online and with sound. So let's check that out. been a couple of days so I want to make sure everything is working properly all right and I really need to save this so that I can just go to it rather than having to click link after link after link YouTube does not make it easy to check all right, so it's definitely, it's got audio, so we're good there. All right, going to close out some windows just so that I don't get close to any limits. Oh yeah, I had a bunch of windows open, so that probably would have started causing some lags. All right, so what you see in the title today again a little bit different from normal uh, I've got a customer where I volunteered to kind of open up their modem router where they've had multiple um, power strikes surges um, transients whatever we want to call it that have killed not one but two ps4s and also took out um, a switch which of course resulted in HDMI failure um, but also has caused surge damage into the uh, LAN socket. So we know that we've got power coming in uh, via two different ways, but how it's traveling and bridging from LAN to HDMI, going to see if we can get a little bit more detail to figure out what all paths were involved at the time of failure. Now, uh, I believe this was the modem from his second strike and not the first strike. And the, what is it, the, um, and just taking out the screws that kind of lock all this together. I think it's just the two. The first strike actually took out the switch and the, um, no, video output so it was strong enough that it blew through the HDMI and took out the encoder as well uh, we were able to fix the HDMI he had no idea that the Ethernet was not functional and it is now back to have that part fixed and it's being covered for just the difference in cost as if it had been done the first time around Okay, so this is a first for me with this particular modem, so I do not know how to open it. So we're going to have to look and check and make sure there is nothing hiding in terms of screws. And I don't see any, so this is where these aren't just for cell phones. Uh, they work great for just really prying open everything. And as you can see, this thing is already damaged beyond use. Now it does power up, or at least I was told by the customer, and I should have asked for the power plug, which I could just use a universal, but we're getting into it now. So basically just had to shove it in there and find the grooves. And once we got them, we just start kind of popping tabs, similar to open up a PS4 or other kind of plastic wedge tooth whatever you want to call it lock electronics so this is what we've got so far we're going to see if we can flip this over I'm trying to get this last little keyed slot out what do we got going on there we go. Let's see if 
we can get these to dislodge. Ah, oh, yeah, they're just some kind of tacky glue on the back. No doubt some insane 3M adhesive. Uh, that had a lot of bite force to it. I am using the new tweezers that I talked about getting from Amazon. One of their... can't tell if that was um, the snap of glue coming off, sticky, adhesive, whatever we want to call it, or if it is the snap of that bond being so tight that the board gave way before it actually released. All right, let's just take that out, make things a little bit easier. Really what we're going to look for is see if we can see signs of damage coming through on the data side versus the main power side. And that should give us a pretty good indication of where the point of entry was for this device. Did it come through on the coax? Did it uh, come through... Actually, it was pretty much only connected via coax. Um, and the LAN socket. So... Is it possible that the HDMI switch got hit, transient moved up through the HDMI of the PS4, and then back channeled through some circuit to then feed back out the uh, Ethernet into the um, into the modem's Ethernet, so out from the PS4 into the modem slash router. This is a combo, so this customer went and bought their own, and rather than paying Comcast or whoever their service provider's rental fee was, which is actually an advisable step now. It used to be questionable whether or not to do it, I think because that technology was moving a little bit quicker and a little bit faster, but the change from uh, router technologies now has gotten a little bit further in its gap and you're pretty safe where you're going to see that device last you for a while as long as it doesn't get a lightning strike. So I do recommend purchasing your own versus paying, I think they charge like 10 to 15 bucks a month for them now. So, I mean, in 10 months, you could have bought a $150 one, which is pretty good. And I think maybe at most you might be able to go one step higher in that $200 bracket. And you could even still get that because on average your service provider tries to stick you with these for as long as they can really but two three four five years is not abnormal so at fifteen dollars a month it's more than paid for itself with making that little bit of an upfront all right so let's get back into it and see if we can look over this and as i bring more light in it's now wanting to kind of that should balance out and it makes this kind of go a little high on color but we need that scope we're going to keep the logi big and when I say logi I'm talking about that's my little nickname on my streaming app for my Logitech camera which is what you're looking at this three now let's see if I can point this little photo here in the top corner that one is what's coming through our scope, and that will give us the ability to kind of zoom in on some of these items here and see if we can probe around. But to be honest with you, I don't really see anything. Oh, and that's going to be a pain in the butt, so we would have to lift that, and it is soldered on, kind of like with cell phones, where you have a little heat shield. It's soldered on at... Let's see if we can show it in the camera. Okay, you just couldn't see it there because there was too much shiny going on. All right, so right here, you can see that soldered in. What we want to do is let's just take all this tape off. Let's get to where we're looking at the device as a whole. 
Now, we're not really doing anything at the moment, so there's no need to glove up and all the other good stuff. But if we start laying down flux, we'll throw some gloves on because we're probably going to have to remove that shield. And I'm just going to leave all of these connected. Actually, you know what? Great thing about taking videos is you can see where everything goes when you go back and watch it. And it's great for accounting for where parts went. All right. So now this little guy here looks like an Ethernet controller. But obviously only goes to the one. This other one here is going direct into the processor. And let's see. Now I can read this on mine. And you can too. So what that says here is a BCM546 62E. Let's take a look at that because I think that's probably the easiest to access at the moment. And as a Bluetooth controller, we can see if it's shorted through that controller. What did we say that number was again? We, we said BCM546T. So BCM546T. See if it pulls it up just off that. No, it starts talking about database of money transfers. That is not what we want. BCM546T2E. Well, that returns absolutely nothing. BCM54612E, not T. Not T. There we go, and this is a Broadcom. I think we're even going to get a data sheet for it. Documentation, product brief. Uh, I don't think we're going to be that lucky. BCM 5454. Five, four. You son of a. Our cycle is active. Let's just take a look and see what we can find on well, the first one that's listed in this line. I doubt highly it's going to give us a schematic, but it does give us kind of some info about how data flows through the chip. Um, it does do a bit of a schematic. You can look it up online if you want, but it's, um, what do they call that, where you have a flowchart type schematic. So, I mean, it is viable, but it's not as good as seeing all the pinouts and everything that's there. It's not quite as clear. All right, so let's turn on up yours. I think it is time. For a new multimeter. All right. Let's go back and check and make sure that you can see what I can see. And that answer is no. There we go. All right. So what we're going to do quickly is just look for shorts. This is kind of like a no-nonsense probe. That is supposed to be short. That is ground. 
well, not short. We just probed ground to ground. Should say that should be in continuity, and it is. But these are not, and they are not supposed to be. All right, and now you'll notice you get a chirp every now and then when you ride over something, and then it quickly goes away, and that is normal. Um, again, I'm not an electrical engineer, so I don't know all the specifics behind it, but in a general understanding, basically, we've got something that is kind of um, probably like a diode built into this where there's a bit of forward voltage, and so for like almost a fraction of a second, a millisecond, or a whatever, we're getting that pulse, and that's where we hear that chirp, and then it kind of charges up and locks itself down, making sure that we don't have a short. Now this chip, other than going out and probing points for, um, what is it called, um, for the dot, now that is a problem. And this is where we have continuity between these two data lines. And I don't know if that's supposed to be the case. Ah, oh, no, those are ground. These are the data lines. Oh, the, no, I was probing the right ones in the beginning. Let's slide this a little bit forward. All right, so continuity, continuity. Continuity and continuity. And so now let's see, we are going to go ahead now and glove up because just based off of that, I want to go ahead and remove that Broadcom chip and see if our continuity between those data lines. And let's check one other thing. Let's look at, so we got... Oh yeah, we definitely, that's a problem. So we're short between all pairs on our Ethernet. And if you're not familiar with what I mean when I say a pair on an Ethernet, go and take one of your cords, not one you're using, cut it in half and you'll see twisted pairs. There is four sets of two making for eight lines. And you'll notice that there's eight pins on your Ethernet cable. That is how data works over Ethernet, Cat5, Cat4, Cat3, Cat6. Shit, I've been out of class for a while, but I think there's Cat7 has been released, and they all work the same. Eight wires, four pairs, and they should not be in continuity with each other. But here we are. So, that's the end of the day. Haven't eaten yet. So I might be a little aloof, and I'm not wearing one glove. You can see we have the trash man outside. I don't know if that's coming through on the video, but if it is, it should go away in a moment. But it is quite loud. So we're gloved up now. And we could put a little bit of solder in there, and you can tell. I mean, this is just for, um, for figuring out what's shorted. So I'm not really concerned about salvaging this device. I don't need to salvage it. We 
just want to see if we can make the short disappear. So I'm not even going to add solder um, or fresh solder around those edges. We're just going to heat the sucker up and see if our continuity goes away. And if it does, it's an easy indicator that our short is here and not actually on the APU, or sorry, CPU, this doesn't use an APU. Getting used to that from PlayStation and Xbox. It's been a few days since I've actually made a video. I just got really busy and I needed to kind of clean the desk off and when you tend to get slammed, uh, one of the downsides to doing multiple electronic repairs versus focusing in a, a smaller few device niche is that you don't have a lot of part control. There's just so many different things between different devices then you get slammed with a bunch of different tickets and Stuff just ends up everywhere. What is my heat on? Right, we are not going to be hot enough. I'm going to turn this all the way up. So I just have it maxed out, so we're basically at 450 degrees C now. And that popped right off. I was originally at 350, and as you can see, this is a rather thick board. A lot going on in a small package, and because of that, thickness and all the circuitry in between and it sits on a major ground plane just kind of was sucking that heat away so we have to turn it up so that we can get it hot enough fast enough to pop that chip off so now that that's been done we're going to come back and we're going to probe but oh look at that we are still in continuity I don't know if I had to probe that the other time I would have realized that these are independent. We're not short between here and here. But we do still have continuity. That's weird. So at this point, I would think that we would be completely disconnected from that circuit and that there should be no way that these could have continuity between them. But maybe there's some circuitry inside of this. Let's see. Again, you'll hear many people say doing repair videos that your first and best weapon is your eyes, and that holds true forever and always. So we're going to look at this for a second and think. Use your eyes, use your brain. If that is isolated, you've got data pins. We should have just disconnected them. Now these I could see still being short together because they're still connected up under here. And let's just let's just go ahead and pop this sucker off so that we can look. Man, this is gonna make me want to have tweezers, isn't it? Or, like I said, we don't really care about salvaging it. And all I'm doing is just pulling these pins out, as you can see, the little plastic tabs. There we go. And look at that. 
didn't even use thermal paste. It is using a thermal pad. And this is where with thermal pads, you have to make sure that you get a really good quality. Otherwise, they'll suck at transferring heat. They will just do a horrible job. All right, so let's take a look and see which we could probably see what chip was in it from. Uh, it's got some sliminess to it, doesn't it? It must have been kind of like a sweat coming off of that pad from when it heats up. All right, before we get too crazy here, we're going to go ahead and do the rest of the probing that I would have normally done. And basically, what I'm doing now is I'm checking our power side to see if we're short there. And I mean, just based off of this, I would already want to conclude that we're probably not looking at a power line short. And that's also indicative of the status of this device that the... Um, uh, the customer reported is that when he turns it on it turns on but it goes to a red light where normally it would have switched to a green and when you have a constant power light whether it's red or green it usually means that your power in so this DC circuit in was functioning properly however the red light is notification of there being an error most likely a short detected somewhere else in the logic side of the device and not on the power because if you had a short on your power you wouldn't turn on so I already had the assumption that we were not dealing with a power issue and to be honest with you I think everything here confirms that we're not now we can let's hit that switch and see yeah we've got this is you can see this here that is a power on switch that's off that's on and even when we turn it on, we only get continuity on our ground side. We're not getting it check out that coil. I don't know if you, yeah, you can see me tapping on that. We get a kind of a, a low ohm response. Again, this isn't necessarily a short, it's just saying that it's less than 50 ohms, which is where this kicks in. And it's even, it's given just a strange pulse. Um, so it's, it's kind of where we do have some energy that is seeping through, but it's, I mean, it's at 49 right now. So this is not a short, this is just a very close to the multimeters threshold for sense or for sensing continuity. Now that is interesting. I'd have to look and see what that pin is. It actually looks like the JTAG jumper. So if you wanted to um, bootstrap some hackware into this, you probably do it here. And I'm just kind of playing around now. I'm just tapping things to see what I get. And after a while, here goes another little tag area. And this is probably... Uh, I see this is J2, oh, this is J1, so between these two, you're going to be using those to interface directly, kind of like a backdoor for the system, which is common in a lot of routers. If you've ever dabbled with um, uh, DDWRT and you brick your router and modem, um, and I mean hard brick it, where it's almost impossible to recover, uh, if, if it's an expensive router, you may find yourself opening it up and playing with these bad boys to try to reload and force back in some software. All right, so I haven't found um, my standout. My next guess is we've got the short coming in here. 
following these lines and going underneath our processor. However, before we go that route and pull this to see that it eliminates those shorts, I want to go ahead and try just because it's a very strange to me that we get a continuity between the backside of these pins when they are now disconnected. This here is what I'm referring to. So let's see if we can get you a better look. So the fact that we have continuity all the way across here. And if we look at this, this is where these are going. It's right here. So they should be isolated now. They should be separated from each other, but they're not. So I'm wondering if there's something inside of this that somehow pops those together and creates the issue. So what we're going to do for that is we're going to go ahead and use our vacuum extraction or desolder. You're probably sitting there wondering, vacuum extraction, what? No, well, it's a vacuum extraction, but it is the desolder. Makes it kind of fast and easy once it finally heats up the temp, and I should have turned that on when I knew I was going to use it. But it's now coasting in at 150, and we're trying to get it up into the 300s because, like I said, this is a nice, thick, chunky board, and I know it's not going to want to just snap right out unless we've got some good heat against it. But what we can do to make the job simpler while that is heating up is let's go ahead and we're going to lay down some fresh solder and we're going to change out this tip. I was using a fine tool tip earlier. BCF1 or something like that is what it was called. We're going to go back to good old BC2 tip which seems to be kind of my go-to and what the heck did I just do with that? Uh, I didn't pull it off because my tip wasn't hot enough. It wasn't hot at all. All right. So those are our two there. We want this one closest to that coax. So by putting that fresh solder in there, we just kind of get it nice and prepped and ready for what's coming next, and that is vacuum extraction. And so that we don't have any gum ups, to be honest, I'm not really sure if I'm happy with this extraction tool. Um, I mean, Pace typically makes good equipment, but there's some things about this that kind of just make it feel like a toy. I still need to do the review on it. And this is probably going to get a little funky for this video because I need to be able... You're going to have to watch it on the big camera. So I need to be able to get a straight contact here. But it just... It seems like it gets clogged... Clogged, yeah, clogged not cogged. <laughs> a little too much, too often, unless all the conditions are just right. And I just expect a better performance for what they charge. Because it wasn't much more to go to the JVC. But what made me lean towards Pace was the fact that, yeah, the machine was a little bit cheaper, but their tips are considerably cheaper and have great reviews. I am still curious to try them out as a company, but it may just be a fail for using them. Although I say I talk crap about it and then look at that snap out nice, clean, and easy. But like I said, I did all the prep 
as I should. Um, and these are not big pins. When you start dealing with things that are a little bit beefier, um, the analog sticks for controllers on PS4 or Xbox, that thing really just doesn't handle them that well. But that, it got through nice. Oh, and look at this. I can already see something here. There is a protection circuit in this. And I wonder if that removes our shorts. And it did. So, that is very interesting. We found something out. Now, you know, we have the same problem here. So we're going to take that one out and see if the shorts go away. If they don't, then we know that um, our problem actually more than likely originated in that chip and still resides there. The problem is not fixed, if that's the case. But where are we at? We're getting closer to isolating how this thing failed. All right. And we're still good on temp on this. It hasn't timed out yet. So. <laughs> and I'm going to try not to be ADD and bounce around where my pins don't make sense. Let's follow a straight line like a sane person would do. And so, as you see, the way we use this, at least what it says in the manual, is that you want to use a circular motion where you're kind of wiggling the pin. And what that does is make sure that you kind of heat all sides and kind of get the solder moving. I don't know if you have never soldered before, if you have, but one thing that's weird about it is sometimes you can heat solder up and it just doesn't seem to kind of get liquidous like it should. But then you go and kind of give it a nudge, and it just all kind of comes together and pulls and does exactly what it's supposed to. Hmm, now this one, take a look at that. This one does not have that protection. That's very interesting. It only has it on the one. So now, I don't think that that's going to resolve the short problem because there was no connective medium there. And check that out. We still have continuity on all pins, which means... Dun, dun, dun. Or not dun dun dun. It's da 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 da. da. This is the, the jaw shark moment where we travel down this path. All right. So let's take a pair. We're gonna pick any pair, follow that pair, and boom. Here we go. We're coming in right here. That's our pathway. We can see the other one follows this lower path here. So on both sides, our Ethernet goes in through here. But this one didn't have the problem. In fact, let's, it probably does have the problem. We're just not connected to it. Let's find a pair of pins. Where's a pair? Where's a pair? 
Uh, we're going to zoom in. And we got to get closer. All right. So let's see if we can find a short on this side on our top end here. Let's take a look. We're going. These two are pins. Where do they go? They go here. Now, all I, you don't really have to use a lot of pressure, but you do sometimes have a conformal coating over the parts. In fact, most times you have a conformal coating. So what I'm trying to do to scratch away enough of that coating so that I can use this as a pair to trace what is going on. Now I kind of wonder, because see, look at these. These run to kind of like some open-ended. Come on now. Show me what you got. Okay, so these like I said, we don't care about saving this. We just want to find out what's going on here. All right, so I don't see. Let's see where we have, let's just run pairs. Yeah, so I don't think we, we had a problem at all there. We may not even have a problem on the back end side of that. So it looks like we may have had a surge that, let's see here. So we've got, And they were only connected. I'm sitting here thinking, trying to think of how these two can be connected but not connected, unless, and I'm gonna have to find out from the customer what was what was attached in both slots. He had what running to what, and that would be an interesting thought to inject um, into what may have resulted in this failure. We know that we definitely had a shock on our Ethernet data lines. So we know we had a surge event here because this has tripped its safety circuit. But we also had a surge on a separate line that has resulted in a short underneath at the processor. So what we want to do next is probably look at whether or not we have any shorts. And as we can see, I don't know, here, let me pull this back to where you can see it. For a moment there, the question is, is, is you know, is this a short? But if you follow the kind of, I don't know if you can really, yeah, you can see it. If you follow that green line, Oh, well, maybe it's not. It kind of, well, no, no, because it goes here. This green stays continuous, and it connects in here. So this is a ground pin 
this is a signal pin. So this is probably our coax pin, and we can verify that very easily by There we go. So that is our coax. And we're not short of there. So I'd have to look and see what is the likelihood that this would actually um, I don't think this would short. I think this is going to have great potential to kind of just ground itself out. So more than likely it's going to follow this path to wherever. Let's see if we can see from this bottom side. So, because again, we're just feeding a signal. So if a surge pulse came through here, I don't think it's going to cause continuity. It's not going to burn between the two because, and that's just some, some thick ass grounding. All right, so I think we're going to have a surge event that comes through here and man, this thing just connects to a lot of stuff. So, we're going to try to oversimplify something. All right, this. There we go. So, if we check here, and go back and shove this in here, I think that has to do with AC. We got because now we're now we got continuity. Summoner. All right. So to resolve that, we're gonna have to do something about this shielding. We need to see what's underneath and see if we have evidence of a transient through the coax. Let's crank this heat all the way up, and we're going to assist by putting in hot air. All right, we're basically trying to remove a heat sink, and when you do that, it becomes very hard to get heat into it fast enough to get new solder to adhere without also adding that hot air. And you probably can't see really good. Right now, I'm more focused on the scope being useful for me, so if you can't see the scope, Look at the big screen, because I'm not going to stop every five seconds to align the scope. And it is storm season for us. I guess those in Georgia were not on the coast, but we are near the coast. And when it's hurricane time, it's storm time. It is always hot. It is always humid. And you've got humidity the 90 percent you're gonna have some storms I would far rather be in the Midwest and anyone that knows me knows that Colorado is probably my favorite place to go the weather out there is amazing I probably shouldn't tell people that because then everybody wants to go there I don't go there enough to have to worry about its tourism industry and whether or not the tourists affect my ability to do things. So feel free to go out there. <laughs> You're not hurting me. Alright, so we got enough of that lifted that now we should be able to do the rest of the job with hot air line. Now going back to the talk about Colorado, it's funny that you know Denver is thought of as being a cold place. But it's actually 
um, one of the sunniest places in the U.S. year-round. Whereas Florida claims the sunshine state. And what this does is it shows great marketing. Because Florida is not the sunshine state. It's probably the rainy state. There's another state that does claim that one. I don't know why. Whoever thought that was a marketing aspect? Might have been insane and maybe should have been given medication. Um, I need something to hold this down, but I'm lazy and I don't want to go get it, like I said. This is not about making it work. This is about finding out. Oh, well. Stick me in the balls. Although I still want to remove this just because it'll make visualizing easier. If I'm not having to look and peek around. All right, it seemed to work better when I used the combine. So let's get back at it. And this is where being lazy will get you. We're just gonna flex the crap out of it. being lazy before and didn't use any and I'm learning that lesson up oh, and you know what I just realized that this whole time I have not had my peanut extraction on and that is because at some point I am it. Check out something on that underside. No, no, that is not those pins. Why is that not lifting? Alright, let's stop for a second. And again, like I said earlier, use my brain. I could probably see this underneath, but now this thing has pissed me off. So, it's going to come out, whether it likes to or not. Ooh, that's hot. Touching heated up metal is probably not wise. Watch this thing land in the end. And this thing is on there. Now I could put this on the replay machine and that would make it easier, but you would not get to see that because it is in another room.
Well, no, now. Work with me. I told everybody I was taking you off. And you're trying to prove me wrong. You know what? We're going to take this nozzle off and get a bigger area of heat flow. You see if that helps us. Our quest to remove this forsaken heat sink. And there we go. Sometimes you got to use that brain. And I don't know why mine wasn't working at that moment, but all sounds pointed to, yes, I have a lot of heat, or I have a high heat, but I didn't have a lot of flow because I was using that nozzle, which put my stream down to a concentrated airflow. And it's just such a long distance there that by the time I started moving down the line, it just didn't have enough airflow to keep what I had heated melting. Now we have that. And we can see everything nice and clear. We're going to need this to cool down before we start probing on it. But we can speed that up a little bit. And you'll notice, I don't know if you can tell from the video, well, there you can see the, uh, the bubbling, but how obvious it was once I started using that high flow and a lot of flux that I did not have my... Um, fume extraction on because it just got cloudy real quick. Not only is the flux and solder fume something you want to extract, but you saw that bubbling. Boiling isopropyl is not a fume you want to inhale. So having that extraction on kind of keeps you living. All right. So now all the goodies inside here are going to be what allows us to determine if we can see a change and what we're going to do is okay so this one goes out here this one was actually what we probed and tested and found we had continuity on ground and pin. And to be honest, I'm not sure if that is correct for this. Being that it's connected to that coil on that single line, I want to say no. But we do see here that this coil is connected to ground. And it really just depends on the wiring of this thing as to whether or not it's supposed to be that way. And that's where a schematic would be super helpful. It would tell us right away whether or not we have a bridge, an intentional bridge between this area or if our surge event caused some of this enamel core coating to basically melt and allow continuity where it should not be. We can kind of, I mean, ultimately, if I really wanted to, I could tear that apart and make the determination from there. You're still really, really hot. And that just goes to show how much that board had to be heated up. And that is hot. Super hot. Like, so hot I can't keep touching it with one hand it will burn me as an after effect. It's like indirect. I'm being infrared cooked right now.
so hot. All right. I think we're just about hot, 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 hot. I like hitting switches. Until I'm bored now, there's nothing to do except to wait for the heat to go, and I'm just pressing buttons. I don't know why, but there's something that is methodic and soothing about that. It drives the shit out of other people, but when you're the one pressing the button, it doesn't seem to bother you. I think we are good enough now to test. And for once, my multimeter decided. All right, so that is why we're getting the connection between it. The question is, is, is whether or not it's supposed to be that way. Without tearing it apart, to be honest with you, I got no idea. I may be able to look at it and kind of infer whether or not I think it should. Um, one question I have is, is ground isolated? No, this is DC all the way. I'll have to think about that. I don't think it should be. And, and that that might be an indicator. Hey, if there's an engineer on here that knows, watching this video. I don't have a schematic, so you know this is where having a higher level of understanding of electronic engineering goes to help without having to remove this, break it apart, tear apart the wires and go, okay, yes, it is supposed to be that way. But I mean it would it would not Knowing the way that coils work, I wouldn't think that it would be normal to want to um, pump that signal um, through ground, but maybe it is necessary because it's a coax data signal and it's not, I mean, you know, it's not AC current that's going to bridge over to. Um, to DC side at high voltage, um, I'm guessing a data signal would be almost kind of like a, and this is a low AC transient because you've got that pulse and you can have AC running through, um, what do they call it? There's a name for that, for when AC is on your uh, DC circuit. And there's a certain amount of tolerance that's acceptable question is, is, is that how it works on a coax data? If you know, post it in the comment section. Save me from eventually becoming curious enough to tear this apart and figure it out, because I probably will do that, even though right now I'm saying I don't want to, and I, I don't plan to, but I tend to be stubborn and curious, and that results in me tearing crap apart for the sake of knowing. All right. So that is good. Those channels are not. This line comes out. That's going to be that little pin line that we looked at earlier. And it goes through there. Comes up here. Comes through on this one data side. That does look like it goes to that ground circuit, and it does. So this is like a ground line. Look at that. So I don't think that our problem, I originally thought that maybe if we see a short in here, um, we would have some insight as to definitively this was a cause. But I don't think we're going to find that that is our, that line. Now 
Now that we want to look at closely. It's not usual that you have just two of those pins being ground next to each other, but it is very possible. And I'm looking at, I mean, if they were, this is obviously part of ground plane. And it makes sense with that being like that. But unless we look in tighter here, why would they cut away here and have that gap and then have another gap here all for it to be part of let's see if you can see this uh, alright we're going to try to come in as close as we can with the scope we're going to use our handy dandy uh, cat connects there Let's clean this up with a little ice purple. See if we can make it more visible for not only you, but me as well. Alright, so there's a clear separation between there and there. So why would those both be ground? if they were intentionally separated. And it's not to say that it's not possible. In fact, we may open this up right now and find that it's exactly the way it should be, but it's suspicious. And if something is suspicious, we'll just assume it's a problem. And my nice new tweezers are already getting fucked up. Excuse me. I try to make it friendly for everyone, but sometimes you just gotta drop an F-bomb. Now, it's a weird thing about YouTube where you see streamers that try to eliminate the person for the sake of, you know, they want to be advertiser friendly, they want to be full media friendly for different ages, whatever their motivation is. But in today's age, does it really matter? Do we need to care? I don't know if we do. I now, more than ever, curse words are on TV, and to be honest with you, I've always been a firm proponent of a word is a word. It only has as much power as the person hearing it gives it. So if you think that four-letter words are bad, that's your hang-up. There's something wrong with you, not the person saying it. Alright, now, this is where, if that was a ground pad, I could tell you it would not be the way that it is now. So, we can, and in fact, we'll take this here, and we'll flip it. Where are you, you little piece of crap? We lost our visual. All right. So those pads are not connected there. They are not connected here, which you can see where the ground pin is clearly looped in to, and maybe you can't see it clear now, but I'll zoom back in just to show it. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, it is tied. I might have to say, excuse me, and never mind. so weird that they did not bridge that left to right. Okay, nope. My B. That is definitely a ground pad. So that was not short. Everything here is as it should be. Ground, ground, ground. Those are data, except for the fact that I think this one 
that would be ground coming through on this side. Uh, maybe some of these are, but no, because we didn't get any pops from those. So everything under this chip is the way it should be. So, let's go ahead and get rid of these for stability. And go back to this. Well, right, let's just go back now and we're going to probe and check there. And I'm going to lift this using the hot air just so that we can watch these disappear. But seeing how this Oh no, that does not, oh wait a minute, that is our ground, no, that is our, oh tits and nuts. So we got a new question, now that we have removed that chip, there is no longer even continuity there. What the? Okay, so is that something else? Well, let's take a look at this sucker. Okay, so we don't get it there, but we get it both here. So we've got different pins here. All right, so this, look at that, ground. And this is where schematics become super helpful. Ground, ground, no ground. This thing goes here, which, oh, look at that, that is our, okay, that's why this one goes to that coil. So that one's expected to be that way. That sucker. So now it's got it through the bottom. It's got it through the top. So if we check it here, we got signal on both sides. Continuity, I should say. And if we go here, we got continuity. That is supposed to be continuous. We have no continuity, which is what I would think that we got a signal wire here. But then we do get continuity there, which confuses me. I don't get it. Oh, wait a minute. Was I? Oh, I'm such an idiot. So I was doing that. Okay. So no. And no. What the hell signal is that? All right. something going on there. There we go. Oh, screw you with the butt. Okay. I'm almost certain. No, that should be isolated. That should be isolated. I may be wrong and call me batshit crazy, but this, in my opinion, should be isolated. Oh, my full air, like I said, my full air words are coming out with me an aggravator of this because it's a pain in the butt. Oh, look at that, lift to the pad. But, we're not going to just keep ripping. We stop. Alright. So, now that we've done that, now, 
And again, we're hot, but we've taken out all the circuitry from here, so we don't have to worry about heat and do shorts. No, we're still we're still ground. here it just does not seem right to me short to ground there. Alright, so we're going to take this off now. And this, you know what, is a great opportunity for me to test out something that I doubt is going to work. The question is, where the heck did I put it? Oh, baby. Man, I don't even think that is big enough. Okay. Let's make a, a new kind of video inside of a video, and that is WTF uh, um, pace. I'm pretty sure this is like your biggest socket. You want to fix an issue. Look at this. And we're, we're getting off track here, but come on now. Pretty sure, I don't know, maybe, do I have another? I, I might have a bigger tip than that. But, and we're not going to get any vacuum off of something bigger. Maybe we will. We're not going to get enough contact. Make a, uh, like an oval-shaped tip. A tip that has, you know, a line that this slides onto so that you get good contact across the length. And in the instructions, it says for these types, you want to go forward and back, not circular forward and back so that you get that contact that you need to melt that solder and then vacuum it away. Well, why the hell, as a manufacturer, don't you make a tip that works with that type of um, connecting pin? Because that's all those pins are used for. Those pins are not used for data lines. They are not used for, um, I mean, technically that is a ground, but it's really not even used for a ground other than when the ground is holding a heavy beefy component like this so I consider them more mounting pins than anything make a tip that's made for for straight edge mounting pins make a tip that's what you do as a company all right that was my Screw you for not thinking of that as an engineering side much earlier. Oh, I do have a bigger one. Okay, so this is the largest tip. The other one was about the same size. It just had a thicker wall, making a smaller internal diameter. But look at this. Hey, good that they done with that. And we're going to try it. We're going to prove that this does not work. And Pace, feel free, if you find this video, to comment and say how I'm an idiot how I don't have it right and that if I simply just buy this tip that it will work <laughs> but I spent a thousand dollars on your equipment and I feel like it's missing some things that would make my life easier which is the whole reason I bought this and I know this machine does not cost a thousand bucks but the tips that I bought as starter tips plus the machine as a kit with handle da 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 extra Filters, sponges, whatever, thousand bucks. But yet it's lacking, and it shouldn't be. And I get it. it. It's not as expensive, and I'm not asking you to include the tip with the kit. I'd have bought that tip extra. I'd have paid you more money. 
I don't need a handout. I just need some forethought. And that's the problem. I think, and again, you know, manufacturers, they got to be profitable. But you know, to a certain extent, it's where you know, you're just doing a disjustice to your customer base because you're not thinking of the stuff before they do. And you got people that are paid to do that. They do nothing but sit there and think of different types of tips. And maybe it's not necessary because in a shop that charges way more money than I do, they'd have multiple um, reflow stations where, you know, they just infrared heat this from the bottom and then come at it at the top with the auto pick and out she goes. But that isn't what we're doing here. We are going to give this some hot air assist. We're even going to cheat a little bit to see if we can make it work. I doubt we're going to be able to, but we will try. And we're at temp on that, and it wasn't anywhere close to even trying to melt it. Than getting anywhere near where it needs to be. Yeah. So, back to my original statement WTF pace, why don't you have a tip? It's made for this. What's the point in getting back in the soldering iron? But they can't make lightweight work into the things that just hot air by itself isn't really that great at. So watch this not work, and I'm going to end up having to pull out just a good old desoldering weight, and it will get the job done. Push really hard into the board. Mm. It's a good thing we're having fun because this <laughs> is not how it was meant to be. Okay, so that is another fail. We're going to turn that off. We are going to put this hot air down for a second, and by we, I mean me and you. We're in this together. All right, so, juice all these fat boys up, and they are fat boys, because these things in manufacturing ate all the metal. And this is actually, I believe, a knockoff braid. But using hot air and already vacuuming some of it out, we're going to see it work. But man, ever since switching to the legit stuff, and if you want to get legit, I think there's a few sellers on eBay. I've thought about putting some of mine on because I have way more stock now than I need with this. Um, vacuum extraction, but I would direct. I mean, if you want the best price and you know you're going to use it, just don't open the package until you're ready. I hate the waste, so I don't want to just throw away this stuff. And if it was on a board that I cared about, I wouldn't use it because, as you can see, it just doesn't work that well. So you end up kind of scraping away at the board to try to get it to solder up. Turn the heat up on that. And because it doesn't want to wick, you end up using more heat than you want it to. And you can see this braid starts changing its color 
when it gets too hot. And I thought this was going to be a short video, but started to make a little progress, kind of got sucked into it. Alright, we're going to try taking that off. And let's, before we give up on the fake stuff, let's go ahead. We got our heat all the way up. I could switch tips, but to be honest with you, this tip should be able to get it when we're using hot air. Alright, so we got that. We're going to punch this down to 350 so that it doesn't overheat our wire as quickly. Excuse me, I had some phlegm in my throat. Uh, turn this airflow back up. Okay, and it's not that, like, I do get good use out of the pace machine. It's not a horrible machine. But I think considering that pace markets themselves as, you know, one of the first or the first, I think maybe they claim the first. And they do, they have some great inventions, some great products. But, I mean, they could be doing so much more, especially if they were the first. Is it that you were the first and kind of, did so well that you rested on your laurels because you know, there's equipment out there that makes yours just look antiquated. And I know they are going through and they're updating a lot of their stuff, but I'm underwhelmed by this desoldering iron. And I took a long time to decide on it. And I'm kind of wishing that I would have just spent the extra money and gone the JVC route. Although maybe the JVC one sucks. If anybody's got a JVC desoldering iron, tell me. I mean, one of the detractions that I did have from it, and this wick sucks. All right, I'm gonna put away this fake stuff. Let's pull out the reel. Actually, I think I'm lazy and I don't. I need to buy one of those tools where this thing comes out. But take a look at this. All right, yes, these are slightly different sizes, but what you want to pay attention to is look at the difference. And if you're saying, oh, well, it's, you know, that you blew hot air on, this one didn't. I mean, yeah, they look, they all look like copper, but if I put the same size together, what you would notice, I mean, look how thin compared to the thickness. That's the difference between quality and knockoff. They, they do this, like, really nice braid, but it's so super thin that it just doesn't have the wicking ability. And that's what you need is that thickness. It's going to want to suck up that solder and have a path for it to travel. And when that thing is too thin, it just it loses the wicking action. And this is desoldering wick. So when you lose your wicking action, you basically lose your purpose in life. And that's what this thing's perfect. Look at that. Look at that. It's already wanting to suck up stuff. That is a desoldering braid. That wants to do its job. That other stuff, and like I said, I used it for a long time. I thought it was good. I never really thought it was good. I always complained about it. <laughs> but it, it, it got me out of some jams in the past. So 
I can't say that it didn't have its usefulness, but once I realized that it wasn't me, that it was the product I was using was not legit and it was not as good as the real, I sought out the manufacturer. I asked, how, what is the minimum quantity that I'd have to purchase? And I bought it. I think I actually ended up buying more than the minimum quantity just because I wanted to know that I had all the different sizes that would benefit me. And it wasn't a fortune. I mean, I think I spent 200 bucks on desoldering braid. But I got legitimate, real um, good way. And they do have a U.S. distributor here in the United States. I mean, when you call them, they're speaking Japanese. I think the guy, well, actually a lady answered the phone. She had an accent, but easy to understand. Very nice, personable staff. And she transferred me, and I guess <laughs> somebody picked up the phone that wasn't intending to talk to me. And he answers the phone, mushy mushy. And I don't know what to say. And it turns out, I mean, the guy hung up on me, and I don't know if that's because he's superstitious or he realized he was talking to the wrong person, but it turns out that the Japanese person answers or answers the phone, mushy mushy. You're supposed to answer back, mushy mushy. If you don't, then you may be an evil spirit because evil spirits can't say mushy mushy. At least that's one of the things that online said was the story behind that phrase and how it became one that answers phone calls or an answer to a phone call instead of hello because you would think they would answer the phone konnichiwa but instead you get mushy mushy so in the future if you call in to a Japanese company someone answers the phone mushy mushy don't worry about it just say mushy mushy right back So if we didn't learn anything about this router today, we at least learned something about someone else's culture and a phrase. And if you're more interested in the story behind that, I mean, there's a whole write-up on it, how it came to be. And again, it's just, it's kind of urban legend, so nobody really knows if that's the real reason behind it, but it's the reason now. All right, and so even this can't get it all out. And again, I'm being lazy. I'm tired of using the hot air. We're going to get this off, and it's going to be the end of this video. I think I've gone far enough to figure out what is our expected cause. You know, and this is just my opinion. I could be wrong. Like I said, I'm not an electrical engineer. I didn't go to college for it. But I've learned a little bit over time. And I'm not, like I said, after we take this off, I'll be more certain into what my thought process is here. Let's try to turn this all the way up. And this is a wasteful way to do this. Like I said, there are better ways. I could re-wick this with some good fresh solder, and that may help get these joints out. Kind of get that solder moving it may be old and kind of just past its prime but i'd really like to not have to take those extra steps oh i see that moving get down in there suck it up suck it up buttercup get it get it and this is why i like cheap tips because then I can treat them like garbage and not feel bad. Because when you get one like this that you're just playing around with, you can be rough and you can be mean and not have to worry about the tip. If this, although if it was one of the uh, other tips, it would be able to support this heat. I'm sorry, not support the heat, to generate the heat itself rather than needing to add in with the hot air. And probably wouldn't need quite as much pressure. And 
the reason why I'm using my tools to kind of maneuver this is because using this sustained hot air, it has made this entire line, the heat will go all the way up it, and it would be burning my fingers if I was trying to touch it right now. All right, I think that's as good as we're going to get it. But basically, I was being super rough. Rougher than you should be um, with a clip you care about. Because chances are it is going to be damaged quicker, faster. But those are cheap tips. I'm using a like a Chinese knockoff version of the Hacko is what that one was. But it's one that is, actually, I'd probably say the best quality knockoff on the market. And I shouldn't call it a knockoff, because it is its own thing, but they do use the hacker nomenclature for their tips. Alright, so look at that. We're just using some hot air. I probably could have done this a while ago, but I wanted to show that um, the use of the cheap solder wick and the legit solder wick, and they're both cheap. I mean, real goop wick is not expensive. It's just not. So to cheap out and buy the Chinese stuff, I don't think most people are buying it because they want to buy the knockoff and save maybe a dollar or two per roll. But they're buying it that way because that's really what's out there. That's It's one of the, probably the most cloned products in the soldering industry is the Gutwick. And as a company, I mean, they got a problem with that. What they need to do is they need to get a better distribution in the United States so that you don't have all these fakes running around. There's, I think there's enough demand for what they do to have it. And after working with the company directly, they, they do not make it easy. I can't imagine that a lot of companies buy directly uh, from the Gutwick supply. Or maybe it's just a few companies buy from them and then they redistribute to pretty much everybody else. Maybe everybody buys it. They're just buying it from known trusted sources versus what the average consumer does, which is goes on eBay, um, AliExpress, all those different places that cheap shopping tends to gravitate towards. And they end up with fake stuff. And as you can see, there is a difference with the thickness. Um, you know what? Before we close off this video, I'll put a bead of solder on the uh, the table. And we will watch the difference between the two sucking those up. All right. So, again, we got to wait for this. In fact, while we wait for this sucker to cool, let's leave that right there so that it stays in view. Um, no switches, no camera tricks, no anything special is happening. It's just raw and gritty. All right. So while we wait for that to finish, I'm going to cut off all that. Look at that rainbowing. Uh, you can't see it. Where's my microscope? Look at that. So we're going to cut all that off. We're going to get to the good stuff. It starts right there. We're going to go ahead and we're going to make two of these. Did I not group those? Some of them. Oh, there we go. There goes one. I got both in my view. Are they? They are not both in your view, though. All right, now they're both in the view of the camera. We are going to use equal amounts, make this a fair test. Look at how smart I am. Oh, you can't see. So we basically just have that, halved it. it again. All right. Yeah. Well, you saw both sides. So they are equal portions. 
for the most part. I'm not perfect. I can't cut exact portions. I don't have a scale that weighs that well. All right, so now we're gonna melt these. Oh, you son of a. Why did I do that that way? I claim to be smart and then I do something dumb. So that was a waste. If we want to use it for solder, I should have done something different. But that's okay. We're going to cut a new piece. And we'll cut a bigger piece this time. Double the size, double the fun, right? So what we're going to do now is ball this up. It's like a magic trick. Boom. Dave Blaine ain't got shit on me. And Magic ball number two. So the way that we do this now, we're going to turn our airflow down, so we're going to leave it up high. And we're going to let heat do its work. So we get a nice solid core there. Come on, make a ball. That's what good solder should do. It should ball up nice and look at that shine. If your solder balls up like that, but it doesn't shine, it looks like a funky turd that dropped out of a metal demon, then you probably got BS solder. It should ball up, clump up, and shine up. All right, so now, Take off this excess solder from our tip. Look at that. Nice and fast. Alright, let's go back to now this one. We'll preheat little flux. That flux is really going to help this out and I always recommend adding flux to your braid, especially if you got the cheap knockoff braid. Look. Alright. That nah, didn't really show a difference. I think we just got too much heat there which makes it nice and easy. It's not like when you're trying to heat up a product that's rapidly losing heat. But let's take a look now and look at the two. So, if you want to compare difference in quality, which one do you think is going to wick away more product? In fact, you can already see how this works. And now, take into account, this is wider. So if this had been, and that's probably the next test I need to do, if this had been the same width, we would probably see that that solder was up here somewhere. Meaning that yes, you are saving money on the cheaper stuff, and then one, it doesn't, it doesn't wick as fast, it does not wick as much, and it does not retain its heat and withstand the heat as well as this stuff does, as we saw that it discolored much faster, much easier, and more often than not, this doesn't discolor. Even when I subjected it to the full 450 and let it go on for a while, it didn't turn like that color you saw in the beginning of this little example where this had that kind of rainbow patina to it. So although you didn't get to see the struggle because we're using good quality solder, and in fact what I should probably do is show the difference between the two with your Chinese knockoff solder because I still have rolls of that, which I will not use. If you would like 
a free roll of solder. You need to pay the shipping to get it, but I got some solder I will ship to anyone that wants it because it's garbage. I haven't thrown it away because I hate to. Um, I'm sure there's a way to probably make it better, but it probably just needs to go in the trash. And it's, you know, it's your standard solder stuff. It uses the brand name that everybody says is good stuff from China, and it's probably not made by that brand. They probably just cloned the, the sticker and slapped it on and said, you know what, we're going to call it this because that's what people are looking for. It's kind of how it works. So we should be at a good temp here. All right, so we took an intermission from this. We kind of played around with some desoldering lick and doing a, there's my quotes, test. So now that this is out, we want to cool down. We want to go back to it, and we want to see, do we still get the same um, continuity beeps? Or was the coax actually short? Holy crap, it may have actually been the coax connector being short. Uh, that's our lovely torn pad there. Okay. Oh, we're not in BP. In beep mode, we're in capacitance mode, and that is never, ever, ever going to work. All right. But still, no beeps, no beeps, no beeps. We get beeps there because that is ground. Remember, we had shorts over here. We don't have them anymore. Come here. No, maybe we did have them on this side. Maybe that was on that side. But we were getting it here. Let's go back and let's test. Now, this sucker was hot a second ago. Let's test this bad boy and see now that we have it up and out if we can get some insight. Oh, damn. We should have started with that. I'm pretty sure that's a short. She's a short. A indication that our short originated from our coax in from the cable service provider. And if I was this customer, I would be a hell of pissed. So again, this is my opinion, not fact. Comcast don't sue me when he sues you. Just my opinion, somebody with a degree in electrical engineering should watch this video and say, you yeah, shouldn't do that, and that is definitely a short, or somebody should at least pull the schematic and say, yeah, there's a problem there. So I guess maybe that's the way to start this off, is in the future, if you believe that you had a short come through basically a line surge, come through your coax and blow out your equipment and cause damage to your TV, game console, um, switch, whatever you got plugged up. And again, as I always say, electricity does not follow the path of least resistance. It follows all paths until it chooses a path of least resistance and eventually ends up at some type of a ground. Um, that's what electricity is looking for. It's looking for a path to ground. And until it gets that, it keeps on moving, plugging and chugging and looking for ways to go. Or it gets some type of suppression, which then redirects it back to ground to protect your devices. But if it doesn't get that protection and it goes and surges and follows different paths, what it looks like, if I had to make a guess, I would say we had a short or a line surge. Come through this and blow this device out, causing it to go short to ground. And I could probably go and get my modem and test it and see if these two are connected together, and that would probably then definitively say whether or not these should be like that. Um, but 
it then flowed through this. It obviously then went and traveled whatever path it goes through, which most likely means that it went up through the APU because we know now that we have an APU to our, um, again, sorry, not the APU, CPU. Damn acronyms. Uh, <laughs> CPU, our processor, to the um, HDMI. And this possibly, probably, in my thought, is where he had it connected to his um, PS4. It then shot through this to the PS4. And then from here, went and blew out. Now, the first time it did Ethernet and HDMI. The question is, well, again, we think that it originated from a line surge and not the other way around. Obviously, we definitely have a coax line surge, at least in my opinion. Again, I'm going to go and I'm going to check that later against my own and see if what should be ground on that is, in fact, and I'm making a BS example, if, in fact, on mine, that the center pin and ground are shorted. Maybe they are. Maybe I'm, I'm just not in the know. Um, but if they're not, then that is a line surge that has shorted these, which then in turn allowed it to flow out and into our little setup here, which then probably popped the PS4. And one of the reasons I was doing this was to find, you know, is it a... What's the way to word this? Is it common for there to be a common, <laughs> if that's not a, a confusing way to state it, is it common for there to be a common path between HDMI and Ethernet so that if Ethernet blows on a PS4, that it then can zap the HDMI and vice versa. If a short was to, let's say, originate at the... Um, the, the, in this case, the person used a switch, which probably was an active switch and had power running to it. So if the switch gets blown, can a surge go through the HDMI, be so strong that it pops all protections on the HDMI, runs through some type of backplane or back channel, however you want to call it, through that HDMI, and then crosses over to the Ethernet because they share some common mode there in their, their data lines somewhere, maybe they share ground, maybe it's um, somewhere there's an intersect on the south bridge that they're passing through. Um, maybe, because the only time I've ever seen those dual shorts where we have both HDMI, which was the case with this customer's first one, not the second one. The second one was Ethernet only, which again goes to validate the side that it's probably coming from here because he was plugged in via Ethernet and nothing happened ever in any case to TVs, nothing happened to HDMIs other than the PlayStation 4s, which makes me think that it wasn't the switch that blew, that it was a transient that passed from the Ethernet to the HDMI, out the HDMI, back to the switch. And so this is where it, it became a really interesting problem for me and I wanted to, to get this part of the equation in my hand so that I can look at it and get an understanding of where this board says its problems may have come from. And there is a possibility that I could still be wrong. Maybe it did start at the switch. Maybe it went through the switch and, you know, pushed out and crossed over through to the uh, Ethernet uh, from the HDMI, then from the PS4's Ethernet came in through here or came in through I really think it came, the, the issue was mainly on this side, direct with the APU, because, again, this chip did not appear to be affected. And this chip separates most of this data, most of these data lines. I think, no, all of the data lines. So I, I really don't think our problem happened here. I think it, it obviously tripped that protection. Um, not sure what caused that protection to trip. Was it that it sensed that there was a short somewhere else, so it causes that to pop? Or is it that it actually did have enough juice to push in and through? Um, who knows? Again, that's for somebody smarter than me. But 
in my opinion, I think that the customer's assumption of it being the coax is a correct assumption. And that if he does feel that, that you know, having not once but twice, having to replace a modem, PS4s, um, and in this case we were able to get one of them fixed. The other one, um, it is a slim. And with the slim, it goes direct through to that cell bridge, which was the point I was making earlier in my ADD way, is that I don't see the dual shorts on early model PS4s because they used a Ethernet controller chip, kind of like this. And they also used a, um, a USB controller chip, which kept it separate. Now, uh, since the SAC model, those units have been away with those external controllers and they've moved those controls into the and now I'm going to say it correctly, the APU, because I'm pointing to this, but I'm referring to the APU on the PlayStation 4. They've moved the controls and um, connectivity of that to the south bridge and to the APU directly, or from the south bridge to the APU. And that's where you hope, nine times out of ten, that your problem stops at that south bridge. Because once it goes to the APU, you're done. And to be honest, I think that was a bad decision on on the part of of PlayStation. It allows for them to miniaturize, to remove components, make things cheaper, but they did so at the sacrifice of device safety. Um, my opinion, but I don't think they should have done it here. I mean, it looks like, I don't know why there wasn't some isolation put in here when you're, you're running in direct to the chip. I think there should have been some type of, of um, spike protection, a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? There's a, a type of chip array that is made specifically for this, and it should have been installed here, and it would have prevented this issue, um, at least from, from spanning outward. So we could also say that Netgear, you're kind of culpable in this as well, if it did originate from here, because I would expect to see some surge protection on these lines, and and this is not that, that to me is you know, not a good way to go about it. I mean, these, these are not cheap devices. In contrast to what it costs to manufacture, and you can say what you want about you know cost of of um, of engineering and your need for an ROI over a term, but yeah, come on, those, those cost them at at this level of manufacturing, they'd have been paying pennies for surge protection on these data lines, but they didn't. And, and I guess that's where some could say, hey, you know, surge protecting your, your data lines can cause issues. No, good surge protection mm, wouldn't be a problem. And again, I'm not an engineer, so maybe I'm wrong. There's smarter people on YouTube. Maybe they can watch this video and say, hey, that guy at PlayStation Repair, Augusta is an idiot, don't listen to him, you don't want search protection there, but you know what, if it means the difference between maybe dropping a few packets, which, I mean, error correction and handling is going to take care of that, versus blowing up hundreds of dollars of devices, and I work with commercial clients as well, I have had commercial clients that have zapped their entire network of point of sale systems, um, ATMs. I mean, I had one client that lost over $8,000 in equipment. And again, it's his fault. <laughs> um, because he, did, he was provided surge protection. It was even hooked up, but it got moved and they did not reconnect it. So we had all of the, the data devices on a, a uniform power supply with surge protection and that would have created the isolation that they needed but it ended up getting plugged directly into the wall it took a surge and it then zapped everything although who knows maybe you know what in hindsight maybe it didn't come from the wall we thought it was during a storm maybe it came from his coax side and so that's where maybe the surge protection wouldn't have done anything for him however if there was some suppression on these data lines. And, and it obviously can be done because they do have it on the HDMI um, of the PS4, which obviously if the surge is high enough, it's not going to protect. Um, they have it 
on, um, I can't remember if they have, I think they, they may or may not have it on the Ethernet, but I think the Xbox has it on the Ethernet. Or maybe they still use the controller. Again, I'd have to look at these things, I'm going off memory. But it, it is done. It's not uncommon practice. It is practiced by some. So I think here it was just a matter of, you know, saving those pennies. And it bit them in the butt. But you know what? It shouldn't. It should be there just because you can't assume that protection lies elsewhere. But the reason why I would say they could get away with this is because technically the protection should lie elsewhere. If it was an external power from the wall coming in that caused the surge, or obviously this is a DC in, so if the AC conversion um, was fine, but maybe there was a uh, an issue on the DC circuit side of that power brick, you know, that that's where there's things here to handle that, and there's things inside the power brick to handle that. But if, and I lost my train of thought here, but, um, Oh, there is protection for this. And I want to say they call it the line filter, but I'm not sure if now they use like a line filter and search uh, uh, protection differently. But uh, there's a very high quality. And I think where some of the people go wrong with surge suppression on the line is they go out and buy what's most common and what's cheapest. And that is going to be 70 ohm or 75 ohm. Um, surge protection or line filtration or whatever they want to call it. But 75 ohms is not appropriate. You want 50 ohms. You need a 50 ohm connection. That is that is what you're rated for. And if if that 50 ohm line filter is the same as the surge suppression, which is installed by most um, providers, it's often not checked. And so what happens is surge protection is not infinite. It's not forever. It only ha can handle so many surges and then it fails. So as it gets struck over time, it's clicking through its opportunities and eventually all its opportunities to block are gone. All of its protection has been lost. So yeah, you've got a surge suppression on your system, but it's it's defunct, it is no more, um, which is where now most surge protectors actually, you know, they have that little light for you're protected and a lot of them will shut you down if that surge protection is done. So they force you to be protected, which results in them selling their equipment, so it's good for them. But I want to thank most line filters from uh, companies from or surge suppression for um, coax networks is, is not going to turn you off because most people don't want the interruption and that creates issues. Um, and it's something that technically is covered under your cable provider. if. If, in fact, they do provide this, if the line filter that I'm thinking of is the same as surge suppression, then, uh, you know, they, they don't want everybody calling them saying, hey, it's out, you have to replace it. It probably saves them millions of dollars every year if, you know, they got dead surge suppression out there that isn't blocking your service, but you haven't been struck, so it, it's not needed at the moment. Or you get a little bit of a surge, but not a good enough one that it kills anything. So probably for the most part, people don't notice it. But if this is the case and it is considered common practice for your cable provider to provide that and they are not swapping it out when it's bad or if they know that there's a routine maintenance to it, you know, they know how many surge suppressions it can withstand within a certain reason. And over time they can estimate that, you know, the average person is going to da 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 and you come up with a life cycle for it so they should know that it's going to fail or need to be changed within a certain amount of time. But guess what? They're not going to come out for that. Um, it, it, it wouldn't benefit them because it's not a, a chargeable service. And you know what? If this is the case and you as a company are ignoring changing out suppression on the coax because it's not a profit tool, I as a consumer would rather you start charging me for that. Um, if it protected my devices or just tell me where I can buy one, sell it to me, let me hook it up myself if I don't want to pay you. Because I think those are technically done by line techs, which on like Comcast would be a level three, I think. Uh, maybe the lower level guys can do that. But from my understanding, a level three line tech is $150 an hour. Um, they're not cheap. And that's where they don't want to send those guys out. Those are the guys that are running cable, that are like running fiber cable for them. 
those are the, the guys that are, you know, your Cisco certified or whatever line techs so that they can get the big jobs done. The jobs they're billing thousands of dollars for expecting to make millions off of its life cycle for whatever customer base they're installing it. But if that is the case, if, if this needs to be replaced and it is something that normally has been serviced by the cable service provider, and I'm just saying Comcast because they're one of our providers in this area, um, I'm not even 100% if that's his provider, but they are a very well-known name. They're all over the nation for the most part. So if, if this is something that they typically would service and replace as part of, of what they're doing, and the cost of cable has been dropping, and it gets more and more competitive as time goes on, so you start to look for what things you can reduce cost on. And this is something that's hard to explain to customers because they wouldn't understand it, so maybe it's just been kind of one of those ignored things. And again, I keep beating around the bush, but to get right into it is that transfer it to me. Make it a cost that I burden. Make it an affordable cost within reason. Don't, you know, say, oh, you're paying $1,000 for it, but you need it or otherwise everything in your house will blow up. Uh, you know, make it reasonable. Like the, the glass pack one that I've recommended to customers, I mean, it costs 75 to 100 bucks depending on who and where you're buying it from. So it's, it's not a cheap part to get a really good quality one that is not going to cause signal issues because the cheap ones are crap, and crap will get you exactly what crap gives you. And that is crap. Crap service, crap connection, crap. Buy a good quality surge suppression if you want to put it on your coax. And you're going to look to spend about 75 to 100 bucks for it, and that's before you pay somebody to install it. It's as simple as putting in two... Uh, two coaxial screws so you could do it yourself I think also you got to run a ground line out so you got to screw in a ground line um, if you don't know how to connect to your house's ground line then you probably want to call a, you know what in fact for the purpose of this video I'm telling you call an electrician because if you go outside and you start messing with your panel or your ground line and you grab the wrong wire because you didn't know any better you're not saying this guy told me to do it and he killed my brother southern son mother daughter whoever that ain't on me. Whatever you do from what you learn in these videos, that's on you. But, as I've said, is it's as simple as connecting two screws, one on each end. They're coaxial screws, something that all of us have at one point done. And then you got to screw on a ground line, which goes to your home line ground or ground line. Um, other than that, that last part of that rant got long. But as I start to look at this more and more, I want to think, in my opinion, we got a, um, a surge through the coax. And again, I need to go and test this on my own to see if these are supposed to have continuity between internal pin and external. I don't think they do, but again, I could be wrong, and this may not even be bad. Um, but if it is, then that more than likely indicates that our surge originated from here. It is possible that it could have terminated here, but I don't think that's the case. I think it originated from here. And that would indicate that there is no surge suppression on the home line. And if there is one, that it has failed. So the question is, is why wasn't it serviced before it failed, if that's the case? And like I said, if it's a, an issue where the price of cable has consolidated so much that they no longer feel that it's viable viable for them to continue to service with quality components, the surge suppression for your coax lines, then transfer it to the consumer. Make it their responsibility, at least inform them, because consumers aren't informed that it's even possible to get a line surge from the coax. And if you don't know something, then you can't be proactive against it. And that is where this customer wants to be proactive against it. If they need to take care of it themselves, they're more than willing to. Um, because obviously it's been costing him a bit of money. He's had to buy a new modem, he's had to buy new PS4s, he's had to get his PS4s fixed, and he's had to get a new switch. Um, I would probably recommend replacing HDMI cables and everything, because when you get transients like that, they cause issues with lines. Um, it, it's a cost, it's a burden, and it's a pain in the butt when you lose a system that you may have also lost data on. So long story short is that if this is the problem, whoever your cable service provider is should make you aware that this is something either they're going to take care of 
or you're going to take care of. But find out whose responsibility it is to make sure you've got some form of surge suppression on your coax. And then from that, then um, adjust accordingly. Either buy it yourself or have them install it. To be honest with you, I would probably rather do it myself because they're going to put in the components you want or they want. I'm going to put in the components that I want. And like I said, there are lots of different ones out there. And the reason why they don't put them in is because they're a, what is it called? A, um, uh, it's a consumable. It, it's an item that, again, it has a finite amount of uses. And when those uses run out, it needs to be replaced. And if they have to burden that cost, let's say it's, a hundred bucks which they would certainly get a deal on the part but let's say okay it's even seventy five dollars in a lot of cases that's one whole month of service so I could certainly side with a cable company that it's no longer justifiable for them to be responsible for this component because it is replaceable it has to be replaced over a routine service and it's to protect your devices from things that are really I would say out of their control because those line surges can happen for a lot of different reasons um, so I think it's just we're, we're in a transitioning period where the industry needs to evolve, that if that is or has been their responsibility in the past, that it no longer is, they can certainly be a company that installs it, treat it as a profit center. Say, hey, you can do this yourself, or we can do it, and this is what it costs. And if a person decides to do it on their own and save money in the process, that's on them. Or if they want to use a higher quality component, and that's what I would recommend if you're going to treat it as a profit center, you know, only sell the best quality because that means less issues for them as a provider and better protection for you as a consumer and if you don't like the price of getting the best quality part installed by them then go and buy it yourself and put it in yourself or pay somebody that's trained to put it in that gives you a more favorable price other than that that's it for today this video I thought was going to be short but interestingly enough, it captivated my attention and we dug into it. So I hope you learned something from this. Um, if you're experiencing this issue yourself and you're watching this video because you're curious to find out maybe where your problem came from, hopefully this helps you pinpoint and isolate was it a correct surge or was it a power from the wall surge. As always, I think I already said it. Hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you learned something from this video, and there will be more to come. If there's something you'd like to see, feel free to post it in the comments. If there's something that you saw in this video that I did not address, feel free to add it in. That's what the web is for, to have an open discussion. So again, that's it for today. I'll see you on the next video.